Thank you everyone for joining us this morning. My name is Josh Lipsky. I'm the Director of Policy and Programs of the Global Business and Economics Program at the Atlanta Council. Uh, we're so pleased you're here today and taking a few minutes of your morning to join us. Today's discussion is part of our ongoing series to help understand what's happening during this global economic crisis and looking at the long-term trends in the global economy. You've seen from the Atlantic Council in the past three weeks our quick reactions on health and geopolitical implications of the crisis. And we're also committed to convening discussions as the crisis unfolds on the global economic front. And last week, as part of this series, we had as our special guest, Jason Furman, former chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. And this week, we are so honored to welcome Professor Carmen Reinhardt to the virtual Atlantic Council. Professor Reinhardt is Professor of International Finance at the Harvard Kennedy School. She is co-author of one of the great economic books of this century, if I can say so. It's called This Time is Different, Eight Centuries of Financial Folly. I think it's especially relevant right now, so we'll talk about that. She's world-renowned for her scholarly work on macroeconomic, boom and bust cycles, financial crises, and she's considered one of the most influential economists in the world by Bloomberg, Forbes, Foreign Policy, myself, uh, so we are pleased she has joined us today. And before we get started, just a reminder to send your questions in online through Zoom or on Twitter using the hashtag ACCoronavirus. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and just jump right into the conversation. So we're about to get the jobs numbers here. They're coming out in a minute. But before we get to today's numbers, I'm wondering, Professor, if you could just walk us through a little bit what we saw the last two weeks in the weekly claims and why what we're gonna see in March is gonna look different than the shocking numbers we saw over the past two weeks. Well, what we're going to see this morning is really the tip of the iceberg because we went into the coronavirus crisis with uh, unemployment rates that we had not seen since the 1960s. So we really, what we're about to see only captures the very beginning of the turmoil, the last two weeks of March. Um, most of the, a, a plausible estimate, if one were to look at the unemployment claims uh, included in the, in the figure we're about to see, you would think, you know, the end of the world, but the likely outcome is something around seven tenths of 1% or that is very much the, the, the number that uh, one, uh, one hears of estimates based uh, between the relationship between claims and unemployment. The real bad unemployment uh, news will start really hitting full force next month. So this, I just have the numbers here. I'm looking on Twitter. This is, at least to me, I'm curious for your reaction, somewhat tracking, it's down 700,000. I think the consensus forecast was around down 100,000, given, as you said, the reference point was mid-March right. before we believe the worst of the layoffs had happened. So we're, we're getting more of the data in and we'll unpack it, but what do you make of that top line number? down 700,000 for the month of March? Uh, look, uh, this, this event, this whole crisis is so out of the realm of prior experiences. Um, if you look at the global financial crisis, as severe as it was, one of you know, among the worst recessions uh, in U.S. history in line with other very deep financial crises. It took us about 24 weeks to get where we are. We've, you know, so the, the speed and severity that we're seeing here, there's just no uh, historic comparison that one can connect it to. I'll talk a little more about that later. Yeah, I want to I want to get into those historic comparisons. So just the top line numbers again for those who are just joining us, it's down 700,000 in the March jobs report, 701,000 to be precise. Expectations were down 100,000 and unemployment rate rises to 
expectations were rise, I think, to 3.8 from the historic lows of 3.5. Yeah. And as you, as you said, I mean, I think the historical context is important. I, this ends 113 months of job creation in this country, going back to 2010, the largest stretch of job growth on record. Um, we knew it was coming, uh, but just to see it in real time on paper, I think for those of us who have gotten so accustomed to seeing those positive job growth numbers is still shocking, at least to me. And, and as I mentioned earlier, this is really the tip of the iceberg. When the GDP numbers uh, come out, it will be, you know, the, the I, I do not do forecasting, but you look and take the data that's already been out and you get, you know, a decline of two, two and a half percent, which is of course very bad, but it's not many standard deviations away. Uh, but by the time we get into the second quarter, I think it, the, the numbers for, for some time to come will, will really be something completely off any historic uh, comparisons for the U.S. And really and we, for most uh, advanced economies uh, going through this as well. And it's interesting because, you know, what we were hearing last night, this morning from, you know, most of the forecasters was, well, this ended mid-March employers and the sort of the, the national shelter in place orders, or at least the state orders hadn't really taken effect. So I is what we're seeing here is that employers were basically projecting the loss of revenue and we're laying people off sooner than we even thought was happening. And what kind of strain is that placing now on our unemployment systems in this country? Well, uh, I really can't answer the question of whether, you know, there was some preemptive or very rapid, everything is, is happening extremely rapidly. And the fact is that um, about 40, around 46% of employment in the U.S. is in medium to small businesses. And this is where, well, everywhere is getting hit because the airlines are certainly not small businesses and they are where they are. Uh, but the enormous spike that we've seen, which again, it, the, what we saw in 2008, as deep as it was, it was much more gradual, you know, over the course of more than 20 weeks. Uh, the big spike we're seeing is that, uh, you know, the service industry, is, and a lot of the medium small businesses uh, don't have the buffers. Right. And so the response is, is very immediate. So let's let's talk a little history. You've written about this recently, and everyone is sort of trying to grasp for historical comparisons. It's helpful in a crisis, and you're a great chronicler of past crises. What, what to you is the most relevant historical comparison of what we're about to live through, or is there one? So first of all, let me say that I cannot speak to the comparison of the medical dimension of the phenomenon we're going through of the pandemic. But if you were to look at the 1918, uh, uh, the Spanish flu, uh, the Spanish flu, again, not referring to any kind of medical context comparison, but the Spanish flu uh, occurred during World War I. So if you were to try to figure out what the economic impact of that pandemic, as severe as it was, it wouldn't be of any use to, to us now. Uh, for the following reason, uh, 1918, World War I, the big production push that has accompanied the major wars, GDP grew 9%. Real GDP grew 9% in 1918 as U.S. deaths uh, topped at around 675,000. This is like the highest mortality rate since the data is out from 1900 to the present. Um, business failures in 1918 actually diminished. And in, in so using it to 
as a guide for what's going to happen or what is already happening is that's not where to look. My closest comparison, and this is without being excessively bloom and doom, uh, where you see core similarities in the global setting is to the 1930s. And you see this, the night, in the 1930s, you had a major breakdown in global trade. In the 1930s, you had a very deep crash in commodity prices. Uh, in the 1930s, you saw volatility spikes in the financial markets, very much akin to the roller coaster that we have been living in from day to day. Uh, this is not sort of a casual, I mean, if you look at uh, volatility indices that are frequently used in financial markets like the VIX, um, I have constructed such proxies for that era, and that's the only period where it's really comparable. But importantly, this is importantly, I think the biggest comparison to the 30s is that if you go back to our global financial crises in 2008, 2009, it's called global, but it was really financial crises, banking crises in 11 advanced economies, mostly Europe and US. It was not a crisis that really spread out to the emerging markets. It did not hit China. Of course, every country had its a very bad fourth quarter of 2008 and a really bad beginning to 2009, but very swift recovery, very substantial growth right after, while the slump in Europe in particular continued. So it was really an advanced, 2008, 2009, advanced economies. Those that have, you know, that like history or that are like myself uh, have studied it, um, the 1980s, the debt crisis, uh, the so-called lost decade for Latin America, but it wasn't really just Latin America. It hit Africa. It hit lots of Asia. Uh, that was an emerging market crisis. The advanced economies were fine in the 80s uh, for the most part after the deep recession in 81, 82. Uh, this is global. And the last time we really had global, advanced and emerging uh, synchronously, as we're seeing now, was the 30s. So those are the reasons why I think that is the closest uh, parallel to what we're seeing. So it's, I mean, it's but the again, title of your Let me finish yeah. off by saying that policies completely different. You know, policy response completely different, but the global setting shares many similarities. Well, that, that's exactly where I wanted to go, to the policy response. So given what you said, given what we're seeing here in the U.S., given the most relevant historical example being the Great Depression in the 30s, what policy response do we need to see both in the U.S. and around the world? We've obviously seen a major fiscal stimulus here in the U.S. Different countries in Europe are presenting the fiscal stimulus differently and protecting social safety nets and employees differently. But what do we need to see in a phase four, which I think is more likely now than ever we're going to need in the U.S.? And what do we need to see across the world as a global response to a global crisis? So let me just make a couple of observations of what we've seen thus far before moving on to what we need to see next. Uh, the policy response of we've seen so far is off the charts in terms of peacetime. Uh, this kind of uh, fiscal stimulus uh, and simultaneously monetary stimulus, very important here, extremely important here for reasons I'd like to highlight, uh, is, is also off the charts relative to any other peacetime experience. Importantly, I think importantly of what's been done so far is that it, the, the response is front-loaded. It's, it's likely to have a more uh, immediate, uh, you know, immediate impact. Uh, on the monetary policy front, 
it's I was actually disappointed when the Fed first announced uh, over the weekend that they were reducing interest rates to zero. I was disappointed because what I kept thinking is what we really need now beyond zero interest rates are facilities mm -hmm. uh, to uh, main, make sure that the markets continue to function and facilities that enable the banks that started out, you know, the, our, our uh, U.S. banks were well capitalized, by and large, uh, had been, uh, you know, regulated, all kinds of measures were taken post-crisis to uh, make them healthier institutions. And all of a sudden you have a sh this kind of shock in which can overnight uh, make the majority of your portfolio, turn your, the majority of your portfolio into a non-performing asset. And so the, the facilities to, to uh, support the, the banking sector, to support the municipal market, the mortgage market and so on. That was, what I want to highlight is that the Federal Reserve also has had a major role, which is a major contrast also to 1930. So where do we go next on the fiscal? Um, I, in terms of some of the discussion that is of course in play and that we are all uh, hearing, I am not uh, the least bit convinced that at this stage, really talking about infrastructure investment is the route to go. Uh, we need something fast, something that is, again, the emphasis on front-loaded because uh, people are, are you know, the, 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 as we have dis started this discussion talking about the job, the, the marked and swift deterioration in, in employment conditions, so those households uh, and those businesses that are quickly failing need the support. And so, so uh, among the things that are being discussed are um, proposals that would involve voluntary uh, participation by individuals, but uh, things like uh, tapping into your social security and getting say $15,000 up front if you agreed to work nine additional months after the official retirement age. So if you were expected to retire at 65, you retired 65.9 months mm -hmm. uh, in exchange for getting that liquidity, that injection of cash uh, at the moment. So cash uh, advance the, from Social Security. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, and that goes to, uh, again, the, 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 the need that households that are not only um, dealing with job loss, but in an environment in which the co whole concept of search for employment is not possible. Uh, that may be, uh, you know, one of the, the, the most promising uh, ideas that that I've uh, that I've heard, given the the abrupt, because I cannot stress it of how 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 huge these uh, how how significant the deterioration and how quickly it's been relative to even not just let alone your garden variety recession, but even to uh, financial financial crises. I, I mean, I think the point you made is really important because the, the nature of this crisis requires creative thinking and you just presented some of it. You've also written about debt moratoriums and I'm wondering if you could just talk about that I a little bit because that's the other type of I wanted to talk about that. I wanted to talk about that because that has a direct domestic uh, implication as well as a global one. Um, on the domestic side, uh, again, going back to the situation of a household or of a medium to small size firm uh, in which uh, there is no income. And so 
in a state when income and your capacity to repay your debts is been temporarily suspended by uh, the, uh, the 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 policy of, you know the policies in place to contain the virus, um, then I think the other side of the coin is debt payments should also uh, be temporarily suspended. So what the advantage of a moratorium is, apart from what it does to relieve the immediate anxiety of not having income and seeing mortgage payments pile up and, and other debts uh, go unpaid, it has several advantages that are, I think, fairly intuitive. Uh, for one, it helps avoid the destruction of credit standing for both individuals and firms so that when normality returns, as it eventually will, uh, it's much better for them. They're in a much, much better poised uh, to be able to borrow, to be able to function again. Um, the other, I think, uh, issue that I wanted to raise in this context is, I think, uh, the suspension of uh, a debt moratorium, a temporary debt moratorium, uh, also is gives the capacity for households to deal with the necessities that uh, dominate uh, at a time like this. In the uh, recent Wall Street Journal op-ed that I did with Ken, my co-author Ken Rogoff, we highlighted, look, and, and in um, a very uh, early piece that I did on Project Syndicate that discusses some of the issues we've been discussing here, um, I highlighted very early on, expect defaults at the household level, at the corporate level, and at the sovereign level as well. So some of the debt moratorium measures um, would also be a way of helping, especially the, the most strapped lower income countries that uh, do not have the capacity to respond. They cannot do big fiscal programs. They don't have, their central banks really don't really have the the capacity um, to offset the the damage done by the pandemic, and so uh, debt relief is a form uh, of of uh, helping at the global level. The IMF and the World Bank are very uh, supportive of a moratorium uh, measure and. Um, an obstacle thus far um, has been, you know, garnering uh, broader support. So, and I, with that, I want to turn more broadly to the world. And just a reminder, we're getting questions in. Uh, use the Q and A function in Zoom, and also hashtag AC Coronavirus if you're on Twitter and Facebook to keep sending them in. And I'm going to turn to those questions in a minute. But before we do that, I, I want to talk about China and then look more broadly at emerging markets. So the, the Chinese growth or recovery story is, is critical to the global recovery story. And the consensus seems to be that China is more posed for a V-shaped recovery than anyone else, given how they've come out relatively quickly from the crisis. We saw the manufacturing numbers earlier this week, which looked relatively positive. So do you, do you agree with that? Do you think China is no, poised no. for a quick bounce back? No, I, I don't think so. I, 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 I find that very difficult to believe because um, there are reasons related to the pandemic proper and there are reasons related to what historically have been big drivers of China's spectacular growth since uh, early 2000. Um, let me start with the last point. Um, China's spectacular growth rate, which 
to put it in perspective, between 2003 and 2013, average growth was above 10%. This was a major global locomotive during the uh, global financial crisis. The, as, as Europe uh, slumped and the US uh, also had a, a, a protracted uh, recession. But the drivers uh, or big drivers of that growth were exports and fixed investment. Uh, fixed investment, uh, huge infrastructure, um, enormous contributions to growth. And right now, uh, an export-oriented economy uh, in an environment in which the rest of the world is still grappling with a pandemic, in which global supply chains are still being impacted and redesigned and rethought uh, as aggregate demand in the rest of the world remains weak, it's hard to see how that would be conducive to a V-shaped recovery. Uh, the, third, the second reason why I don't think, and again, yes, we're going to see some snapback, obviously, but I think the, the, the whole notion that it's returning to a pre-crisis scenario, I, I don't think so. Um, I think what we will have, and to some degree we had even prior to the pandemic, uh, was overinvestment. Mm -hmm. um, and associated with that overinvestment was the very steady upward march in debt and leverage in uh, not only the national government, but especially the provinces and the private sector. So a more levered, you know, a more indebted uh, private sector, a more indebted uh, government sector, certainly at the at the um, provincial level, is also going to be a a uh, a factor holding back growth in a way that the situation was very very different at the onset of the global financial crisis. Uh, more than it more than a decade ago. So I am not uh, convinced of the 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 robust comeback. One final thing, and this is a real downer, but it is what it is. Um, and that has to do not with the economy, but with the disease itself. Uh, we live in a different world. You know, our our uh, medical capacities are not to be compared. Uh, to the 1918 pandemic, but I would note that the 1918 pandemic took hold in the U.S. in March of 1918. It hit its peak around November, the end of 1918. However, the most uh, dramatic, uh, the most dramatic surge in deaths, which occurred in India, occurs in 1920. So, yeah. so you know, it's it, it's not a completely synchronous process here. You know, our downturns may be synchronous right now, but the disease the, the path of the disease itself um, hits different parts of the globe at different times and and that is a delaying factor to to normalization, if you will. So that's that's really interesting, and I think it's important one the the long term nature of this, but also the China story, um, not just for China itself, but of course what China means to the rest of the world. China is the biggest lender, many low income countries, of course, huge factor in the rest of the emerging world of what China does. So, what is going to be the impact here in emerging markets in low income countries? We're dealing with the twin shock, the oil price shock. Uh, what do you foresee happening? in some of these I, emerging uh, markets, which were already under stress. I, I have to say, I am 
I had been worried about emerging markets before all of this uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, emerging markets, uh, which did very well up until around 2013, had been very, very impacted one way or another by the China slowdown. Uh, many emerging markets are primary commodity producers. And China's double digit growth rate was a major boost to global commodity prices. And, you know, as the price of their exports sank in global markets, um, many emerging markets already started, growth really started to suffer well before this pandemic. And uh, at the same time, uh, external indebtedness. Mm -hmm. Uh, in dollars uh, began to mount very seriously. And so, and, and, and part of this story is also China's lending to emerging markets because Chinese lending, about two thirds of it is in US dollars. So what happens to a country who has, whose currency collapses 40% and their income is in pesos and their debts are in dollars. Hmm. It's, it's a very abrupt shock that really uh, can very, very quickly translate into a solvency problem. So, and, so is this um, another sovereign debt crisis? I mean, is, is that what you're seeing? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. And, and, uh, it's, I'm very glad you brought up the issue that we are not, as if the coronavirus pandemic wasn't already enough, uh, that we have the Saudi-Russian oil war right. in the midst of this. So you have countries uh, like Ecuador, for example, oil producer, which at the moment, uh, the oil price that was budgeted into their fiscal accounts was roughly around $48.50, wow. which is, of course, more than double what they actually get because their oil sells even below the, uh, uh, the Brent crude. And... Um, in an environment in which you're, you have a government that's trying to contain the pandemic, dealing with a major loss of revenue over and beyond the re loss of revenue associated with the economic slowdown, um, and facing uh, downgrades serious downgrades by the credit rating agencies and uh, soaring cost of borrowing. Right. The next step being default is, is, is highly probable. And, and you, Angola would be in that list, but more generally what you've been seeing is the longer this goes on, the more countries that are going to be downgraded and closer to that junk bond category, which is right now a very dangerous whether, and this is true whether you're a sovereign or a corporate. One of the things we have seen in this, uh, in this roller coaster weeks we've had is credit spreads widen. That high yield debt or high yield, I'm sorry, uh, high quality debt Triple uh, yeah. A, uh, high grade corporates uh, have done very well. The highly rated sovereigns have done well. Of course, uh, this is what you would expect when there's a flight to quality, when there's a retrenchment from risk taking. Uh, and that really leaves both the emerging markets in the global picture and also. U.S. corporates, especially in the energy area, 
but not uniquely in the energy area, any high yield, you know, uh, higher risk corporate with high yield debt in a much shakier position, much that all that much closer to default. So when we think about EM default, emerging market default, and a crisis in emerging markets, we, we have to talk about the IMF and their role in this as a lender of last resort. So what, from your perspective, one, is the IMF doing what it needs to be doing up to date? And the second related question is, do they have the resources to do what they're going to be, they're going to be called on to do, given the widespread shock you're talking about? So look, um, the IMF has been out there um, making sure that it was understood that countries in need could tap them for emergency funding. In effect, uh, about 85 countries have already come to the IMF to use that emergency funding. Right. Um, is it enough? I don't think so. Hence, the goes back to the issue of why the debt moratorium is not a substitution for, but a complement to uh, alleviating the situation. And let me also uh, take a different turn here. Um, the IMF's mega packages have not been actually to emerging markets. The, the mega packages were Greece, Ireland, and Portugal, mm. and Iceland, but the lesser. But so, so advanced economies were the recipients of the, by far, by far, the largest IMF packages. You know, uh, the situation we are seeing in Europe right now to say that that will also at some point not end in the IMF doorstep is perhaps not, but uh, the strains are extreme. And what I am clearly saying is that uh, resources to cope with the European crisis of 2010, 11, 12, uh, resources, the, the emerging markets were doing pretty good back then. And, and so there was no conflict that, you know, uh, the resources had to be pulled out from somewhere else. Now it would be at a time where the demands are coming from many places. Uh, and the IMF does not have the kind of resources, especially if a very large emerging market or if a, a European uh, semi-replay of, of the post, you know, the post banking crisis, because the banking crisis morphed into uh, a sovereign debt crisis in Europe and it can do so again. I would note, just as in passing, that Greece, Ireland, and Portugal, the three of them combined, are you know over six percent of of eurozone GDP. Italy's over fifty. Um, I'm glad you brought up Europe, especially given what's going on in Italy and now the debate over Corona bonds and joint fiscal packages. I think it's critical to think about. I want to start turning to some of our online questions because we have so many. So uh, again, folks, use the Q&A function on Zoom and AC coronavirus. So we're getting a lot of questions on your discussion about debt. And one of the questions, I'm grouping a few of these together, but are you talking about debt forbearance or debt forgiveness? Obviously, from the international perspective, it's the debt forgiveness is not something the IMF typically does, but you're talking about different things, both domestically and international. So I'm wondering if you could unpack that a little but, bit. Okay. A debt moratorium is a temporary suspension of payments. It doesn't mean I wrote off your debt necessarily. It probably means that you've restructured, you know, the repayment schedule. And it doesn't necessarily imply debt forgiveness. Yeah, right. 
Okay? Moratorium means a temporary suspension of payment. Um, it will, for, for many, many, I suspect, low-income countries, if hit for much longer uh, with this kind of global environment, it will ultimately become another debt restructuring. And debt restructuring uh, means that it can be either you simply change the terms, you give them more time, length and maturities, trim interest rates, or a haircut in face value. Uh, for the lowest income countries, usually it's involved all of those. Uh, and for many uh, emerging markets as well, and for Greece as well. Uh, Greece had one of the biggest haircuts, uh, as so-called, so you know, write-offs. Uh, but that's not what I'm talking about at the moment. That's something that whether uh, a, a full-fledged uh, debt restructuring that results in a deep haircut, in a, in a deep write-off, is necessary. Um, that's to be determined also by the severity of what happens between now and the end of this. But for the moment, it, it, moratorium is, you know, to be clear, suspension of payments, temporary suspension of payments. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying. So I, the question we're seeing also a lot on Twitter here is, should we be worried about massive buildup in debt in advanced economies? Obviously, borrowing rates are really low. We're in a crisis situation. Money needs to be spent. Are, are you concerned? Should policymakers be concerned about increasing debt to GDP ratios that were already on the rise? Uh, this is not the moment for that. Uh, I, I've been worried for more than a decade. Uh, but you worry about that in good times, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, presumably the, the, the whole concept of, of, you know, prudent management is that in the good times you save for a rainy day. It's raining. So this is not the time where one would, uh, this is the time where one would limit the necessary action by concerns about the debt. This is, I think so many have already alluded to the fact that we are indeed in a war. I don't know of a wartime experience where in the midst of a war, a government says, no, I am not going to raise debt because it leaves my debt uncomfortably high. You do what you need to do. Understood. So now there's a question about the Fed that we got in. So you, I think, very appropriately, you know, praise the Fed for their quick actions. Uh, you know, Jay Powell and the Fed have been out in front, more quantitative easing than throughout the whole of the global financial crisis or close to it, depending on how you measure it, but within a span of three weeks as opposed to six years. So what else would you like to see, do you think, the Fed should do from now or do they need to now step back? What more would we like to see from the Fed? What more can the Fed do? Um, I think that, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the Federal Reserve Act uh, limits the uh, or imposes uh, limits on the kinds of, for example, municipal securities mm -hmm. uh, that it can buy. They're limited to very short term while municipalities issue, tend to issue longer term debt, which the Fed cannot directly buy. Uh, this is something that is not just the Fed. This would require, these things would require uh, the other one is, of course, buying corporate debt, which uh, former chairs uh, Ben Bernanke and Janet Yellen have both been talking about. So expanding the range of assets, this is something that uh, the Bank of Japan, you know, the, the array of things 
the array of types of debt that the Bank of Japan or that the uh, European Central Bank can buy is broader uh, than what the Fed uh, is allowed to do under the Federal Reserve Act. So again, this is not just obviously a decision of the Fed. The, the, the Fed, you know, the Fed is a child of Congress. So, uh, but I think the focus on maintaining, and I think that is obviously the intent on maintaining a very uh, active uh, provision of liquidity, including in a mainstream facility. Um, they've done a great deal in a very short period of time. So related to that, we have a question about the role of the dollar. And I think as we near the end of this conversation, it'd be helpful as we think more broadly, long-term impacts. So, the, you know, there's a there's been a rush to dollars all over the world, liquidity yeah. increasing. What is the long-term strategic impact of that on the role of the dollar in the world? Well, it's interesting. I... Uh, Ethan Elsesky, a professor at the London School of Economics, Ken Rogoff and I have uh, two very, two recent papers uh, uh, last year and this year on that very question, really looking at the entire post-war, very detailed data on the different dimensions of, you know, how do reserve currencies, how do anchor currencies compare? And the bottom line is that what we all know, um, this is no novelty to anyone listening, that the dollar is the dominant currency. But very interesting to us was, is not, that was not a surprise that the dollar is the dominant currency. What was more surprising is that it has gained a lot of ground in the last decade. So it was already important in, at the beginning of the global financial crisis. It's even more important today. And there's a couple of reasons for that. And we've talked about some of them already, actually, which is uh, post-global financial crisis. Uh, you know, there are increased doubts about the capacity of the euro to hold. Right. So the euro has receded. Uh, part of that gain in the dollar has come at the expense of the euro. And even if one doesn't doubt for a moment that the eurozone will hold, there is still the issue that in bad times, investors, individuals, everyone wants liquidity. And there is no comparison to the U.S. Treasury market. If you go to Europe, you have the booms, you have Greek debt, you have Dutch debt, you have Finnish debt. It's not a unified market. Maybe this crisis will lead them to that. Maybe the coronavirus bonds, maybe we will have finally, uh, it is a single currency, but there is no single debt market. Right. Uh, and one, one more, the Chinese lending uh, that has gone to more than 100, mostly low-income or middle-low-income countries, is mostly dollar-denominated uh, debt. So, uh, even, so an increasing Chinese presence in finance has not meant an increased presence of the renminbi because those contracts are have largely been dollar denominated. I, I think that's such an important point that's often overlooked when we talk about Chinese lending and Chinese debt. It's it's in dollars predominantly. And predominantly, so, yes. Yeah. No, that's really important. So we're we're out of time, but I, I just want to end on one, you know, a little hopefully a positive question. Um, since, since we've talked about some of the darker historical notes and the rhymes in our history right now. Uh, I saw yesterday that the term good news 
has now been searched on Google more than any time in the history of Google. So telling us that people are looking for some positives and from your perspective, from the economic perspective, either short term or long term, can you give us any good news, anything to, to well, hold look, on to in this uh, moment? What, when I made comparisons to the 30s, I hope I made it clear that I was talking about the global setting. I think the policy thrust that we are seeing in the United States and in many varying degrees, depending on their ability and capacity to do that, um, is unprecedented in peacetime. And so I and and I and it's not over. So I do think that. Uh, I'm not a medical person, so I can't give you positive news on the course of the pandemic. But I think on the what is being done uh, at the national level and at the global level is night and day from uh, that dark, very dark uh, interwar decade uh, called the 1930s. Okay, I think that's a, it's a good note to end on. Professor, I wanna thank you for taking the time. We know how busy you are right now. We appreciate it. I wanna thank everyone at Atlanta Council, the communications and events teams, the Global Economics uh, Program, Ollie, Nick, Will, everyone who's participated to make these events happen. Uh, please, everyone, thank you for joining us. Please stay tuned. Uh, we're gonna have more here. We're gonna to continue to talk about this crisis and uh, please stay safe and stay healthy.